Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to Tom Carnes Patriots Talk Podcast, joined by Phil Perry. I'm in Orlando at the owners' meetings. Phil is holding it down back in Boston. And first things first, let's get right into not Patriot-related stuff, Phil, but NFL-related stuff. We got a new kickoff enacted on Tuesday by the league. No more. Will the beginning of the game look like Braveheart with 10 men running proudly in headlong into battle? Now they're just going to be down the field, way away from their kicker, waiting for the thing to drop, and then they'll scurry into each other. But we don't have to mourn the kickoff, do we? We actually can look at the new frontier of the kickoff, Phil, can't we? Yes, we can, because the kickoff hasn't really, outside from playing in stadiums with some really severe wind conditions where these great kickers now can't boot it into the end zone, it hasn't looked like Braveheart in about 10 years, Tom. It, it's it's now turned into a jog that you might find in the suburban a greater Boston area, you know, any time of day, you just poke your head out a window. You're just sort of jogging down. You all get all the way to the end zone. Sometimes, sometimes you don't because it's, it's a non-play. So I'm happy they changed it. I think it could lead to a lot of creativity, Tom. And yep. I think it could lead to, especially in the first year here, as people are still finding their footing, it could lead to points. We could and see so, a lot of big returns. I, I, I agree. I like it. Um, just to verbally go through it, the easiest way to do this, I don't know if you guys are visual learners, audio learners. I, I learn best by actually seeing something, but I'm going to do the verbal explanation of what this mess looks like for you. Under the new rules, 10 players on the kicking team and at least nine players on the receiving team will line up just five yards apart. They're on the 40, okay? The the kicking team's on the 40. The, the blockers line up on the 35. They can't take off. They can't do any movement at all until the ball – either touches the ground or is received. So basically of the 22 players, we only got the kicker and one or two kickoff returners who are not lined up five yards apart. So boom, um, there are penalties for not kicking it to the returner, really, in in, in essence. Um, the kick has to land between the 20-yard line and the goal line, a kick that goes out of bounds or short of the 20. Receiving team gets it at the 40, Phil. A kick that goes into the end zone for a touchback goes out to the 30, okay? Penal. Penal. Not a 25-yard touchback anymore. So kick it to the damn returner and, and see what happens. This is done to drive down the injuries from full speed, headlong dashes downfield, which end in collisions. But, you know, Bill turns his back for one second. One second in 50 years, he's out of the league, and they change his kickoff. It's unbelievable. He'd be good on the kickoff. I'll tell you what. Uh, I guess I I'm a visual learner, too, because you were about five seconds into that thing, and I had no idea what was happening. I, uh, I, I, really? need to, I need to see it. I need to see it. And I did. I For anybody out there that's looking at their phone and, and saying the same thing as me, or you're like Tom and you need the visual, I did tweet a video that Adam Schefter uh, posted about what this thing will look like. It's an XFL kick um that they've had for a bit supposedly uh and then tom pelicero has the full rule if you want to just read the rules broken down because i'm sure we'll get into it once the games actually start tom will be wondering what they can and can't do and how can they try to take advantage of this thing i just do like there's there's a newness aspect to it that i like that i appreciate it will keep i think it might keep kicking game players in the game like you don't want to see yeah. guys lose jobs because of this so I like that aspect of it, and and I like getting rid of the old one because the old one was really not a play. I mean, how many times did they just dump it into the the back end line? Yeah, and then you'd go to commercial, and it'd be like you know it's the, just the game was supposed it. to start at one o five, and you're you know sitting there at one thirteen, and nothing's happened. Yeah, it's an icing, just an icing. Um, not as excited are either of us, I'm sure, about the hip drop. To me. You are asking the guys who have the worst view on the planet of a play that is occurring, the referees, because they are too close to the action to make a call on something with giant men are going full speed. And the differences between a hip drop, which means that you are generally tackling from the side and then you are letting your legs and your weight swing around, kind of like a stripper pole. You're basically using the, the ball carrier as a stripper pole and then you're sliding down and dropping on his ankles. Sometimes it just happens that way because you were approaching from the side and the guy's going fast and you swing around him 
and you land on your bum. Bum, bum. So it's going to be very hard to legislate. I understand why they want to do it, because the incidence of injury on a hip drop tackle is high. But hip drop track tackles themselves are not that prevalent. I'll additionally say, I just think that they're ill-equipped from the vantage point they're in to make the call correctly all the time, because there's a few different elements to it. And I can see non-hip drops getting penalized and hip drops being missed. And that's why I think it should have been a five or a 10 yard penalty in this first year until they can tell what they're seeing. Phil, your thoughts. And I know that you also um, had some thoughts from pro football focus, uh, Sam Monson. That you thought were yeah. He, yeah. Sam sort of um, changed my initial opinion of this because I think I sided with defensive players and because I feel for defensive players in some regards, there've been so many rules changes that have made their jobs more difficult. Um, but Sam, who I've gotten to know a little bit over the course of the last few years, really smart guy. Um, Irish and has lived in the UK and lived in Ireland um, and has a rugby background. And he had a long thread the other day and, and attached some videos to it. And I just found it interesting where he makes it very clear that it is possible to control yourself in some of these moments, as far as his rugby experience is concerned. Now are NFL caliber athletes moving at a different rate of speed. Yes. Are they a lot of times bigger than these rugby guys? And so maybe it's harder to stop momentum. That's just physics probably, but they have a, they have it pretty down. It looks like in the rugby world where when you are wrapping up on somebody's legs, you just allow your weight to drop straight down as opposed mm -hmm. to flinging your your hips to the side and using it as a stripper pole, as you said, like yeah. it does feel like they should be able to manage that to a degree. And I want to say this too. It's like hip drop tackles are not something you see like 15 times a game. No, it might happen like once or twice a game. There are probably games where it doesn't happen at all. And so I, I don't, I think from a defensive player standpoint, does it make your life a little bit more difficult? Yes. Is it completely possible? to control your body in such a way that you're not picking up 15 yard penalties left and right. Also. Yes. And I would say, mm -hmm. I like the idea of the rule Tom, because I don't want to see playmakers get hurt and anything you can do that doesn't drastically, drastically change the game to make sure these guys are on the field more and they're not coming down with high ankle sprains for, you know, because somebody just decided to land on the back of their legs after a four yard gain. They like, didn't like, decide. I'm it okay with that. that way. They're not I don't know. They're, they're, people make it some pretty compelling arguments out there. It does seem like there are some guys who are a little more prone to it than others. <laughs> and well, like, are they trying to hurt people? I, I would never say just that. Proficient at it. Try to it's do a good something way to get somebody down. Is what I would say. I mean, forward. the bottom line is get them down. If you can get them down, you get them down. And it's, Listen, it's people, good at... people in pro football used to just, you know, open hand smack other guys in the helmet too. And they, they somehow have figured out a way to survive without that part. Head of slap. I think they'll, I think they will figure it out. I think they will survive. You know, when I started youth football, the head slap was still legal, which I thought was unbelievable. And then I tried it once at the age of however old I was and it hurt my hand. So friggin' much like fourth grade, my fingertips that and like, I was going to deliver a head slap that was going to, send anybody on to Whoopieville. Um You're built like mean Joe Green, so that makes sense. That's exactly right. Yeah, Deacon Jones. Um, Robert Kraft spoke Tuesday morning at 8.30. We're going to get you three takeaways from Robert Kraft. The first one for me is Robert cannot help himself with his horniness for a quarterback, and I think it's going to be, well, an overarching thumb on the scale. Here's Robert talking about quarterbacks. As a fan, I put my fan hat on, and I definitely would. You know, in the end, you can't win in this league consistently unless you have a first-rate quarterback and a first-rate coach. On the other hand, you're in different position, and I, we've never been in the third draft position since we've owned the team, and what happens a lot of people behind are really desperate to move up and so we're we're going to be open uh to 
whatever can come our way. But in the end, I'll let the team make the decision what they think is best. One way or another, I'd like us to see us get a top-rate young quarterback. Phil, look, maybe Robert just wants the fifth son back. Okay? It was Drew. It was Tom. It was Mac. Now, he just can't do it without the fifth son. So he wants the quarterback. Additionally, if you are a an owner, you need your franchise hood ornament. You need somebody to attract, to be the magnet, which we will discuss a little bit too. So he really wants a quarterback. I have made clear that I think it's important to explore the ideas of trading down, which I think Robert Green lights to an extent. But with the caveat, you better find a quarterback. Okay, we'll find a quarterback, but we not, might not find the quarterback. How's that, Robert? You got Joe Milton, round four. How do you like that? Fine. You should be able to be okay with that, in my estimation. But for Elliot Wolf on a, an audition type situation, Robert's preference for a quarterback is going to be a big thumb on the scale to overcome. Now, as Robert would say in the dynasty, I never stepped in in 25 years, except that time. I wonder if this will be one of those except that times. Phil? Yeah, I don't think Joe Milton's going to cut it, Tom. You know, He I, doesn't have to. The, the way he says. You get all the other top people. No, never mind. Rate, that, that a top-rate young quarterback. Yeah, he'll come next year. That's or not Joe Milton. That's not Spencer Rattler, who I kind of like. And we've, we're going to have him on the next Pats podcast soon. But I, it nice. looks it's not Spencer Rattler in the fourth round either. A top rate young quarterback means a first round quarterback. And you just so happen to be at number three overall. And if maybe Robert, you're saying like you could, you could still trade down and get your quarterback. Like you could, but the history of teams that trade down and then draft a quarterback, it's absolutely, it's a horror show. Joe Flacco. I don't know if they traded down. Kyle Bowler. <laughs> Shit. Kyle I Bowler. Believe, I think um, the trade down. It's a horror show. So, Tom, you're you're right. It's going to be it, – it is impossible, in my opinion, for Elliot Wolf to ignore this and not take a quarterback. He, Tom, he doesn't yet have the job. I know. I know. <laughs> Robert Kraft I, again today that... confirming that they're going to be doing interviews after the draft. And so now he's saying they want a top-flight young quarterback, and Elliot Wolf's going to say, yeah, yeah, I know what you want, Robert. I'll tell you what you really need. They need a top flight young quarterback. So for anybody out there who's by now weary of my intimations of trading down, it has, again, nothing to do with the fact that quarterback is unimportant. It is important, but I'm talking support system. So if you don't do it in the first 35 picks, I don't think that's the end of the world. Because It's not top flight, though. It's not top flight. No, no, it's not top flight, unless it is top flight which for Russell Wilson, it was top flight and he was not in the top. Okay. Yep. Roll your eyes. It's easy. It's easy to do. All right. Listen, we're not doing that again. Not, not quite yet. Um, the one third round quarterback. Okay. Dak Prescott. Yeah. The one fourth round quarterback, Tom Brady, the one sixth round quarterback, Brock Purdy, the one seventh round quarterback. Terry McLaurin. Yeah. He was, a, he was a receiver. And was fifth round. <laughs> he needed a fifth round guy. <laughs> Three. I'm not even counting this down. Uh, Secondly, folks, my takeaway from Robert uh, was they're starting to get real about how attractive they are um, because, you know, they are sitting there at the dance and anybody who looks at them, they smile and all the person being smiled at sees is broken black teeth and drool coming out the side of them. No one finds the Patriots attractive right now. Uh, Robert Kraft, really, this this was the answer of all answers, um, was asked about free agency, and it's dumbfounding to me that he somehow veered into Calvin Ridley's girlfriend as a reason um, for why the Patriots weren't able to sign Calvin Ridley, and then he bumps up against the real reason at the end. Part of it might be the quarterback situation as well. <laughs> Let's let it roll. I feel bad. But I, I think we've We've actually made some improvements. We're, I think we're getting the system of functioning the way we did. Where this year, um, 
we signed a number of younger players that we had drafted or been in our system and as a foundation if you want to win consistently you have to draft well and then get those players on the second contract and we started to do that this year uh, we we pursued uh, the people we wanted in free agency there was you know one outstanding receiver that unfortunately we we couldn't close um, it was not because of finance. Um, it was he made clearly his girlfriend wanted to be in the South, and um, we had a situation where the taxes were like almost 10 percent higher, and we offered or were willing to keep going to, at that premium. But he didn't. Uh, he didn't want to be in the Northeast. And part of it might be the quarterback situation as well. Look, we can't, they can't, we can't accept this type of thing. You've got to be realistic. You cannot gild the lily. You have to call it as it is. Calvin Ridley is not playing for Tennessee rather than the Patriots because clearly his girlfriend wanted to be in the South. Clearly, Calvin Ridley wanted to be in the South. Now, if he said when he talked to Elliot Wolf or his agent did or anybody else and said, yeah, and definitely my girlfriend just doesn't want to go up there. And actually, somebody tweeted at me that he's married. I'm not going into a Google. I'm not going to go with Calvin Ridley girlfriend. But the point is, the Patriots are not a defined team. And that lack of definition is going to be cast a pall over this team for definitely the short-term future and then maybe through into next year as well you need to be conclusive about who you are and what you are and phil i think that they can't be conclusive because they don't know yet they're still idling around the starting block stretching out figuring out okay who are our players going to be what is our staff going to be gerard mayo talking about i haven't even really had a chance to get into the x's and o's they don't know who they are yet so i don't blame but they're getting realistic, it seems, about them not being a very attractive suitor. There's no doubt that they they aren't and they really haven't been for a while. So, like, congratulations, I guess, if they're just figuring that out now. But this is the reality of the situation. And I actually would leave open the possibility that it was a factor. The, the family situations can be a factor. Sure. If, if but money I just is don't think the same. The but he started with that. If money's the same in both places, hey, like that could be a factor. I just where, didn't like, where you I, are playing. It was not a, because of finance. Clearly, his girlfriend wanted to be in the south, and then he mentioned taxes and and <laughs> didn't want to be in the northeast. But and he just, said they would be willing to make up the taxes. What I'm saying is the money's the same. Would you rather be where it's warm and where your girlfriend's going to be happy, or your significant other's going to be happy, or would you rather be somewhere else where neither of those two things exist? Mm -hmm. it, be that as it may, it, you're, you're right. Yes. Bottom line is you're going to have to overpay, trade for, and draft the people that you want to be the, the great players on your team. The, you have to force them here. Yep. And forcing means you can't just make up for the tax. It means you have to make up for the tax and then go beyond it if you want to buy a player in free agency who has other options. Or you're going to have to make sure you hit like crazy in the draft far better than you have over the course of the last 10 years, Bill Belichick. Mm -hmm. It's going to mean you, you might have to trade for a guy who doesn't want to be here and show him that this is a place where he should want to be and be here long-term and be part of your core for a long time. That's a tough way to operate, Tom, but that's where they are right now. Yeah. And honestly, it's one of my, it's what, as we continue to have in different iterations, this quarterback, take them or don't take them debate. One of the reasons to take them for me is because if you hit, not only have you hit on a quarterback, but you've hit on now, a better chance to land free agents mm -hmm. who want to come play for said quarterback. Again, if he's good, people I, want to go play with Joe Burrow in Cincinnati and Josh Allen in Buffalo. Those are not destination cities. That's how you become a destination. If you're new England and Foxborough. I'll add this too. In support of taking quarterback this year, the continued chatter from top picks about where they would like to go 
Um, Caleb Williams, you know, kind of chatter about where he would like to go. Same thing with Jaden Daniels, chatter about preferred locations. And now Deion Sanders basically giving a list of teams that he would like his son Shadur to go to, to play quarterback. Um, I think Baltimore being the only one in the Northeast, maybe Washington too, whatever. Um, if this becomes a creeping tendency among high profile quarterbacks to go back to the John Elway, Eli Manning practice of, I ain't going there. If that blossoms as a new reality because of an awakening for college athletes, then the Patriots want to get on the quarterback train sooner rather than later, <laughs> because you can't, because that stuff can be infectious, Phil. Wait, he said he didn't want to go there. I can do that. I don't want to go there either. Next thing you know, you have half the draft is Xing off teams. Don't bother drafting me. I'll just stay here and get my NIL money. How's that sound? You like that idea? So it does actually argue in favor of, and I'm not saying that's a driving dynamic, but just be aware of the smoke on the horizon there. Players have never been more empowered than they are now. And never have they been more um, financially secure before they even become professionals than they are now. And so you're right. I don't, that toothpaste is not going back in that too. Yeah. And so it, players are only more heavily managed than they've ever been. Their parents are more involved. Deion Sanders, if you're a coach who has a close relationship with somebody like Travis Hunter, you know, it's not your son, but you feel that way about the guy and he might feel that way about you. Like, He's only going to be more involved and coaches like him are only going to be more involved. And so it doesn't surprise me that players are, it wouldn't surprise me. I should say if players start to be more aggressive in determining where they land because big picture, Tom, and I know we're used to the draft being one way and I love the draft more than anybody, but big picture, when you're talking about workers' rights and, living in a capitalist society that the draft ain't it. No, <laughs> the draft tells you where you're going and when. Yeah. And um, maybe that changes at some point. I think we're a long way from that, but maybe the change is the players start to take the reins for their own futures uh, a little bit more strongly moving yeah. forward. If Mike Tyson would, would say this is ludicrous um, because when you really contemplate the draft and the nature of it, it is ludicrous. Um, but it has worked for a long time and <clears throat> helped us to cover a league that is fun to cover. And uh, well, it's been, it's good for everybody all around. So don't go away. Keep being ludicrous. Um, thirdly, I asked Robert Kraft, how do you balance patience and urgency? Because you're 82 years old. I didn't say this to him, but you know, you want to win, but you have basically cobbled together a coaching staff to take over a team when this is not a group that really came in together, this coaching staff. And you don't have key players. To me, we're going to look back at this in 2028. I'll be stunned if we don't look back at this in 2028 and say, wow, 2024 was rough, real rough. But here's Robert Kraft when I asked him about balancing patience and urgency. Robert, how do you balance patience and urgency? I mean, it's been a few years since the team has experienced the kind of success you guys were accustomed to, but now that you have a team in place that has a big learning curve, you're going to have to be patient or you're going to be back here at the top of the draft in a couple of years. No. How do you balance that? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, that's a function of have we put the right people in place to make it happen. I'd like... I'd like to think there'll be a big improvement next year, and that's my hope. And yeah, it's coming. Yeah, but we know we have to be patient. Everything is new. I mean, I think we have 20 new coaches. Just to be able to integrate them into a system, I think Gerard has terrific people skills, and I think Elliot and Matt have really good uh, knowledge of our product and what has to be done. And, and I've told them, look, I don't want to do splashy things just 
to get attention and get good headlines one day. I want us to do the things that are substantive and good for the short term and long. All right, Phil, you heard me inter- interrupt and just say, wait, wait, you mean this year? <laughs> and uh, he did mean this year. And it, it was deja vu for you? Yeah, I feel like I remember him saying the same thing after it was after Mac Jones's first year. And we had found out that Matt Patricia and Joe Judge were going to be leading the offense. Josh McDaniels was gone. And those guys had just took, taken over with the Raiders. And we were down uh, in Palm Beach for the owners meetings. And he said something similar. He said, I, I expect to, to contend. And I said, you mean right away? And he said, yes. And that that remained his party line for a long time, really until right before we got to last season. Remember that where he started to change it a little bit? Well, our no division is really tough and yeah, it might be tough for us to make the postseason or something along those lines. But um, his expectations, it sounded like Tom were high initially, but then I, I heard another answer and I wasn't there. You were, but where he's, like, he's saying, maybe this is part of the sound that I just heard. I've been getting it in bits and pieces. I just really hope we don't struggle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just really hope we don't struggle. He said it multiple times. So I, I think even he's aware of the situation in terms of uh, what is realistically possible for his team this year. Yeah, they're going to struggle. It's just how how do you look after uh, Halloween? Because it could be ugly early on. You want to be a pain in the ass, basically, Phil. And I said this yesterday. You You need to get to the point at the end of the year of being a team that nobody really wants to play. Can you, can you be that? That's progress. Um, so that's it from my takeaways on Robert Kraft. I want to flip to you because we didn't have you on yesterday. Do you have any takeaways from the Mayo conversation? One or two that you want to highlight? Yeah, I mean, uh, let's go back to the quarterbacks because we can't talk enough about these guys. I did find his comments on Drake May interesting, though it, it seemed like maybe mid-answer. He wanted to try to make sure that he was driving right down the middle on that thing and, and nothing that he said was incorrect but he was he was very over the top with there's no ceiling for a guy like that and let's roll let, back you want to play that sound let's play that yeah. sound what do you like about drake may and the time you spent with him yeah look drake may had a fantastic interview uh at the combine he brings a lot of energy you can tell he has that leadership ability and you know also the exciting part about a guy like uh drake may is the ceiling, like there is really no ceiling with a guy like that. Now, in saying that, when we're trying to put together this roster, I know a lot of people look at the ceiling, but you also got to kind of see how low is the floor? How low is the floor? And um, I would say a guy like Drake May, he has a lot of room to grow. He's a young guy. Uh, honestly, he hasn't played football nearly as much as these other guys. So that's definitely something that, we, that we've that we looked at, um, but he definitely is going to develop. So I did find that. I, I did find that commentary interesting, Tom, because it was it, they seemed to be sort of the only real extensive comments that we got on any specific quarterback in this year's draft class. Um, and he again, he's he's not wrong. He has all kinds of upside, but he hasn't played a lot of football. And there might be a scary floor there that you you have to determine. And that's the job of scouts, and that's the job of your coaching staff to make sure he doesn't get to that floor. And it's the job of your front office to put people around him to make sure he doesn't, you don't have to get to that scary point. Um, so I, I did find that interesting. And then I did, as sort of a follow up to that, what he's looking for in a quarterback, Tom, I thought was an interesting answer. And I'll just read a few of the things he said here quickly because it's a, it's a longish answer. But he says, one thing you want from a quarterback, my number one thing is a good decision maker. Now, when I heard that, I said, Oh boy, that's not such great news for Mr. May. <laughs> <laughs> because that's not the first thing you you think of when you think of Drake May, because he does play a little bit of hero ball given the roster that he was on and he does make some bad decisions. Although I don't want to completely blow it out of proportion because his turnover worthy play rate last year was just a tick lower or higher, tick worse mm-hmm. than Jaden Daniels is, who who gets a lot of credit for not turning the ball over and for being great in that regard drake may's turnover worthy play percentage last year was 1.9 whereas daniels's was 1.6 so it's not a it's not an insignificant difference but it's not massive right um the last thing he says tom or there's two more things that i want to point out to you and i want to ask you who you think that describes he talks about competitiveness and toughness you want to see guys get right back up you know 
their offensive line to help them up. My ears perked up when I heard that one because I feel like there were moments, you know, where Mac Jones wasn't getting that kind of help from right. teammates. And it maybe told you how his teammates felt about him. That's really reading into body language, but that's what coaches do. That's what scouts do. So you want somebody that the people are going to want to play for. You want one of these magnets that he talks about. And I know that stood out to you too, that comment about having magnets, having guys that, that um, players in the locker room want to play for. And I yeah. do think, I do think Drake may has those other qualities. So while he's, he's certainly not number one when it comes to decision-making in this year's class, he does do those other things Mayo talks about. Yeah. I mean, I would peg as we sit here at the owners meetings and we've had a significant portion of the off season and just a month until the draft, I would say if I had to bet or put a percentage on the likelihood that Drake may is the Patriots quarterback, if he's sitting there, I'd put it at 85 I would, you know, I, I don't, I think that they would think long and hard. And we'll talk to Diana Rossini here at the end of this um, about both the Broncos and the Vikings as potential trade partners. Um, but I, I just really think that they're going to be so enamored with the notion of a quarterback and what it can, that he can be the magnet and that there is upside and we're screwed if we don't have one that in the end they'll push away from the table. Because I think that May and McCarthy, even though McCarthy seems to be gaining steam as believe it or not, even the number two pick and Jaden Daniels could be sitting there. The Patriots are going to have an option. Whether it's Daniels, May, or McCarthy, they're going to have three different guys who can either be scintillating and multi-purpose as Jaden Daniels is, can be a tremendous leader with a huge arm and he fits the quarterback suit the way that Drake May does, or he can be an accomplished, though not statistically accomplished player in J.J. McCarthy who has plus plus leadership skills, magnetism, and results. So, I mean, J.J. McCarthy's Mac Jones with worse receivers, but similar results and an arm. Disabuse me of that notion, Phil. He he was a much, I would, I'd have to go back and look at he didn't throw enough. numbers. Plainly. He didn't throw. He didn't throw as much as Mac Jones, right? No, that was that's... more of a pass happy team, whereas JJ McCarthy was run, 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 old school Jim Harbaugh under center. I think his arms better. I think he's a better athlete than Mac Jones. I look at better leader. Uh, better leader well, to I, more resilient. I, I think at the time we looked at Mac Jones. I and know. Remember the commentary that was coming out about Mac Jones before that draft, and it was yeah, those guys love him. Jayden guys were being asked him. straight up, would they rather play with Mac Jones or Tua, and they were saying Mac Jones. And because they felt like there was something to them. There was a, I don't, whether it was, there was swag, intangible competitiveness or edge or something. Swag. That was their, swag. That was their, <laughs> with Mac Jones. It wasn't there with Tua. Last topic I want to hit on is just a little bit of the trade down chatter. I really feel like, you know, the trade down option has entered the chat this week and maybe a little bit last week. People are more readily considering it. Robert Kraft talked about it to, a, to an extent. Uh, Gerard Mayo allowed for the possibility of it being considered. But I really feel like Copernicus out here, you know, telling everybody that the, the sun is the center of the galaxy and that the earth revolves around it. And no one believing them because nobody, but nobody thinks that it seems a good idea. You know, I talked to one NFC, NFC GM we know well. And uh, I mentioned something about what would you do with three? And they just would be, don't they have to take a quarterback? Like, what are you talking about? They don't have a quarterback. I'm like, oh, well, I mean. and uh, another NFC executive, when I mentioned it to him, I said, you know, here's the whole situation. He said, I'd always listen, but if you have a guy you love where you're selecting, you have to take him, which is what we've been saying. But he did allow that there are some bad asses, quote unquote, at other positions if you do trade down. But as much as it has entered the chat, to borrow a phrase, I think that the notion of trading down remains a remote possibility. And that is what I, I bring away from this week, even though we have Sean Payton saying that it's good to be Monty Austin Ford at number four right now with the ability to trade down with a team like Denver, for instance, it needs a quarterback where Sean Payton is or with the Minnesota Vikings who are at 11 and 23 and could come up. It's good to be any team in the top five. If you want options, the Patriots are going to have options, but I still think they're going to default to quarterback Phil from the outside looking in. 
you really really hard really hard to pass on that opportunity if you're in a draft where you feel as though you could get truly a, a franchise guy at the third pick like there's just not there aren't a lot of years where that's the case right. it's just really difficult you know i mean we could go through um gosh i actually went through and did a little list tom believe it or not Years where you would rather not take a first round quarterback who isn't number one overall. So does that make sense? There's a lot of negatives in there. So the reason I I looked at it this way was say next year, next year is going to be the year where you trade up and you go get your guy, right? Yep. Well, in all likelihood, you're not gonna be able to trade all the way to number one overall because that team with number one overall is, is probably going to need a quarterback and they're probably going to take their guy there first. So, all right, let's exclude all number one overall picks and let's look at drafts where there were really good first round quarterbacks taken after number one overall. There's there's not many. <laughs> there, it's it's really difficult. Years where you would not want to take a first round quarterback who wasn't at number one overall. 2022, 2021, 2019, 2016, yep. 2015, 2014, 2013, 2012, 2011, 2010. 2010. And amazing. this helps make your point about usually you don't yeah. find guys like that well, but if you think this is and... but if this is one of those years where you get one then you definitely got to jump at it yeah this is where you get your Bortles's and your your darnolds and your the hell's that guy i mentioned kyle bowlers <laughs> Jesus. um hey i gotta get ready for slants i have to do my whole plan for that and get that thing shot in there um you have prototypical Patriots that continue to get mashed out. Our guy, Darren Hartwell, just sent out the budget for the week. Today, Tom, call him off Kraft's comments, additional owners' meetings, reactions, TBD. Yeah, they're going to be on quick slants, Darren. And Phil has prototypical tickle, prototypical Patriots, and he's going to do his mock draft. Huh. All right, so we're out. Um, I'm going to do I'll a mock. Back. I'm going to do the Tom Curran mock mock. Oh wow! The mocking Tom Curran mock. So we're it. gonna get picks at eleven and twenty three, and we'll see what we can come up with at receiver and tackle. Buddy, this will be one I read. <laughs> All right, buddy. Thank All you right. so much. Uh, see you on slants, everyone. Here's Diana Rossini from the Athletic trying to give us a little intel from around the NFL and Patriots related thoughts. Hey, what's up, everybody? Look who I found. It's Diana Rossini from the Athletic. What's your role there? Uh, I sit by the pool all day here at the owners' meetings, but when I'm actually working, I am the senior NFL insider. So it's basically my job to break as many stories as I can and do the, these deep dives on stories on teams that are having lots of success and sometimes some dysfunction like the New York Jets. Which actually brings us to another team who is sinking to a level of dysfunction that fans are not accustomed to, and that's the New England Patriots. Top three overall pick, you are talking to a lot of the NFL big wigs who might be inclined to move. What are you hearing about number three? So I actually want to go back about a month ago, and I was having a conversation with the GM in the league, and he was saying to me that be ready for four quarterbacks to go in, with the top four picks. And I reported that, and people went crazy. Like, there's no way, there's no way. And now here we are, late March. This mm -hmm. is almost April, a few weeks out from the draft, and – this is heating up again. This is starting up where it's becoming a reality that four quarterbacks could potentially go with those top four picks. So with that three pick, right? So the New England Patriots open for business, obviously are going to look at all the different options that they have and take those phone calls to listen. Is there a team willing to give up a big haul in order to move up? And, and if that would be a good investment for the Patriots to say, you know what? Maybe we, we collect more yes. picks. Yes, yes. Maybe yes. we collect more picks here and continue to build. There's a team down in Texas, the Houston Texans, who had that plan years ago where they started to build. They didn't just get good last year. Right. This wasn't like they drafted C.J. Right. Stratton and became stars. The building started two, three years ago, which is why they're in the position that they're in now. So maybe this is an option. I'm not saying this is what they do, but I'm sure in the building this is something they're discussing of, if we get the right price, should we do this? Diana Rossini, this is something that I've been preaching because when we look around the National Football League, and we mentioned this earlier in the program, do you know since 1998 how many top three picks have won Super Bowls? How many? Two. 
Do you know what their last name was? Manning, both of them. Okay, you don't win Super Bowls with top three picks. Now, is that a high bar? Yes, it is. But they don't even really get to Super Bowls that often. To me, your best move is to be the Eagles, to be the Niners, to build the team around it and plop that quarterback in. If the Patriots decided to do that, would Sean Payton and the Broncos, would the Minnesota Vikings and, uh, and Kevin O'Connell, would those be the teams that you would say would be the prime movers? They are, and they're teams that are telling everybody this publicly on the record, saying we're making calls to move up. We're, we're in on the quarterbacks. Uh, the Minnesota Vikings, obviously, like you mentioned, Sean Payton's just said it yesterday. He's like, yeah, we're, 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 trying, to, we're trying to make some moves. And, you know, people around the league that, that have covered Sean Payton and even fans can pretty much understand the way he operates. When he likes a quarterback that he wants, going back to when Patrick Mahomes was in the draft, everyone knew that Sean Payton loved Patrick Mahomes, which is probably why he was able to – unable to get him in New Orleans because he probably let everyone know. Um, but if he believes there's a quarterback right now in this class that he wants, he'll do everything to move up to get it. He'll be able to convince. He's got that much power in the Denver Broncos organization. He will convince the Penners that this is worth the investment for, for future success. And I think that's the hard thing for a Patriots fan, and certainly as I continue to pound the table about moving down and getting better because you can't support a quarterback. It's not Drake May's fault. So J.J. McCarthy's fault. It's the Patriots' Correct. fault. They're not good enough. But and we didn't even touch on the Vikings, right? But with teams trying they, to go bananas, Patriots fans are going to say, well, if everybody else wants to move up, you're an idiot to move away. Because some teams are desperate. Look at their coaching situations, their GM situations. Jobs are on the line. Teams that have to win. The Minnesota Vikings lose out on Kirk Cousins, a, a quarterback that we know that the head coach wanted back. He was telling everyone that he could tell, well, I want Kirk back. I love Kirk. Kirk, Kirk, Kirk. Right? They lose Kirk. They don't give him the structured deal that he was looking for. He winds up in Atlanta. So now they're in a position where they've got Sam Darnold on a one-year $10 million deal. And they have a pissed-off Justin Jefferson. That's so much money for Sam Darnold. But, it look, is. good for Sam. Good job, Sam. But that's not their plan, right? Sam may be in there to start a few games at first, but they're in to try to find the quarterback of the future. And, and their jobs are riding on it. And the funny thing is – and this is, again, to underscore the point, Sam Darnold was once a quarterback of the future. He was taken two or three. I think it was three. Zach Wilson, the next quarterback of the future for the Jets. We can go on and on with these quarterbacks who teams pluck and then don't give them the support That's the them. example of what you're saying, right? Exactly. Of look at these quarterbacks who we all thought were going to be so successful. How many times have we seen the Sam Darnold experience, right? We all want to believe it's there because he was picked so high in the draft. And I still hear coaches around the league tell me he can play. He's good. I, we just haven't seen enough of it to say yes. That's what we're going to see with Mac Jones at some point. I'm not saying he's going to become a starter, but I would put money, if you gave me the odds that Mac Jones is going to start and win a playoff game at some point, I would put a fair amount of money on that. Well, that's because some point in his career it'll happen. I, I agree with you because I'm a, a firm believer in, in just a, a fresh new space for, for a lot of players, especially when they started somewhere where it just wasn't working. They're rejuvenated, a different style of teaching, a different uh, environment completely. Sometimes, look at Baker Mayfield. And the heat's off. Correct. The heat's Co complete. off. The, operating at the front of the race versus in the back. Is, is a completely different mindset. And so I, I can totally see where Mac Jones could have success. And, and look, I think that's going to be a hard pill to swallow for some, for some New England Patriot fans who didn't want to see him go. What is – there weren't that many of those. <laughs> <laughs> Last question. What is the league-wide perception of the Patriots right now? We heard Gerard Mayo speak this week about, look, we need to get magnets on our team that draw and attract people. Robert Kraft talked about Calvin really wasn't really that interested in coming because the Patriots don't have a quarterback and his girlfriend wasn't into coming to New England. But what's the general perception of the Patriots around the league from your sense? And by the way, that quarterback problem during free agency came up not just with Calvin Ridley. Mike Evans is another example of a player that New England was interested in bringing in if perhaps Baker Mayfield was going to go in there, go there. But um, without Baker going there, Mike Evans did not even want to have a conversation, mm. not knowing who the quarterback is going to be. Um, I, I think the, the mindset around the league right now or how they're viewing New England Patriots is really just a, a gigantic rebuild trying to find just the simplicity of their identity. What are they? Correct. Who are they going to be? Is this going to be a Bill Belichick Jr. team? Is this just going to be an extension of that? Or is this actually really going to be a fresh new uh, approach to how they, they do it, whether that means on the field, off the field, all of it. So I think there's just a lot of question marks 
but I think there's also a lot of belief because ownership is so strong. Yeah, and it's interesting because when you talk about that, they're probably wondering the same thing. How are we going to be? Because you're throwing people together who have met for the first time. you got Alex Van Pelt working with Ben McAdoo. I'm not saying met for the first time, but they've never worked together. And everybody brings their own ideas Correct. to an initial year. And you have to find some semblance of cohesion between All them. All the different perspectives doesn't always mean that's successful, right? Look at Carolina. They had one of the best coaching staffs in terms of their experiences and all the different trees that they were from. And that didn't work. We saw Bryce Young struggle all last year. Yeah. It was a complete dysfunctional mess. So it's it's trying to find a way to collaborate, but have a, a, a the same vision of what they're going to be and how they're going to do it. And it's just going to take time. So if there's one word I could leave everyone with right now, it's really, uh, it's very hard. 